every time I sit down to make a video, I'm like, oh my god, I literally have nothing to say. What am I gonna talk about? Fast forward three hours later and I'm still talking. <laughs> Hello there! How are you today? So I just realized uh, the other day that I haven't posted a YouTube video in quite a while. Uh, some of you may be happy about that. Hopefully a majority of you guys are not. I just haven't posted in a while because I've been busy with a lot of things that are unfortunately not as cool as making YouTube videos. But you know, that's the thing. We're always going to be busy in our lives and we always need to stop and take time to do the things that we love and do the things that we're passionate about, regardless of how busy we are or how many things pile up on, on our to-do list. Because if we don't stop to smell the roses, if we don't stop to enjoy the things along the way and prioritize doing the things that we're most passionate about, then what's the point? And you know, I don't know if you can tell, uh, but I actually really love making YouTube videos. And ever since I posted my first YouTube video, I knew that, you know what, this is what I want to continue to do over the next few years, regardless if anybody watches my videos or not. And yes, I'm aware that my hair looks ultra stupid in today's video. I don't even know what's going on here. Is it half up? Is it half down? Am I half Gen Z? Am I full Gen Z? By the way, if my glasses look a little bit crooked to you, it may be because I hot glued them back together. Okay, so since it's been a while, let's catch up real quick. What do the Gen Z people like to call it? It's been a hot minute or no they say it's been a hot second can someone please explain to me how and why time can have a state of temperature why can't it be it's been a cold minute so you're gonna be so proud of me the other day I read a book okay fine it was a collection of short stories okay fine you got me it was the menu to a Chinese restaurant so how many of you guys have been watching the Olympics this year comment down below what events or sports you guys like to watch you know every time I watch the gymnastics event I think I can't even touch my toes anyway sincerely I hope you guys are all safe from the coronavirus as well as the Delta virus as well as the Lambda virus. In a few years, we're gonna have a whole frat row of viruses. Kinda of messed up, but that's okay. Still a work in progress, I'm learning. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to Megan and join the Discord channel. Okay, bye. <laughs> so nobody asked me to make this video, big shocker, but I was actually inspired to make this video by someone that I work with. She was introducing herself at a meeting. I forget why. Oh yeah, there were interns who had arrived and she was introducing herself to everyone to the group. And she said, I did not think that when I grew up, I would be doing computational chemistry. And that struck me, because at that moment, I asked myself, how did I end up here? <laughs> if somebody asked me when I was like five years old, what do you see yourself doing 10 years from now? You know, the typical interview question. I mean, not that I'm 15 years old today, although I look like I'm 15 right now. The two words computational chemistry would not have crossed my mind. I, I, I probably would have said, I can see myself building sandcastles in Narnia. I can see myself matching into the house of Slytherin. <laughs> oh yeah, and if you're new here, I like computational chemistry. You should definitely enroll in my channel. It's free tuition. Everyone gets an A. The only class participation needed is commenting down below. Anyway, so going back to the topic of the video, which is how I got started in computational chemistry, I actually had to sit down and map this one out. Who am I kidding? It came to me in a dream. So there was some really smart guy, I think Confucius. He said that looking forward, things don't always make sense. But looking back is when we can connect the dots. Wow! So today, we're going to be connecting the dots. My journey of computational chemistry. Stick around. <laughs> so I thought that to answer this question, we should start at the beginning of my academic journey. 
So in preschool, I'm totally kidding. We're not starting from preschool. So I thought that high school was a little bit irrelevant to include in this video. The only thing I really remember from high school was that I carried my lunch in a Costco bread bag throughout all four years, true story. So I really liked biology and physics in high school. I think I talked about this in another video, but the reason why I decided to study Banjang at UC Berkeley was because my dad told me I should spice things up and you know, really elevate my passion for biology to bioengineering. <laughs> And so then I went to Berkeley to study bioengineering. And as with all STEM majors, we're mandated to take freshman level intro general chemistry. And so my first semester at Berkeley, I took general chemistry with this professor named Martin Head Gordon. And if any of you are familiar with the work of Martin Head Gordon, the course title should be renamed from general chemistry to quantum mechanics. In all honesty, because we only talk truth on this channel, after and during this class, I realized that I low-key hate chemistry. <laughs> I just want to clarify, no shade at all to Professor Martin Haygarden. He was an amazing professor. He was super nice, impeccable handwriting, may I add. He even told us in the lecture, like, please raise your hand and let me know if I'm going too fast for you and I'll slow down. I think the reason why a lot of us just didn't like this class was because we were too dumb for him. <laughs> and so bioengineering majors along with other majors have to take uh, intro organic chemistry. So the next semester I had to take organic chemistry and I took this with Professor Volhart. In this class, I learned that in addition to general chemistry, I also do not like organic chemistry. <laughs> this video is off to a great start, isn't it? And so sophomore year, I took the next level of organic chemistry. And for bioengineering majors, this level of organic chemistry is not mandatory, but I decided to take this organic chemistry class as an elective for my major? Well, because I hate myself. What's really surprising is that I ended up loving this class. You know, I really love learning about the arrow pushing and tautomerization. What a rush. <laughs> I love this class so much that I went to all of the 8 a.m. lectures. Actually, no, I went because there were mandatory quizzes, but we could just say I went there out of love and passion. And so the next semester after I took that organic chemistry class, I started to tutor this level of organic chemistry to other undergraduate students at Berkeley. And in my opinion, teaching is one of the best ways to test whether or not you really understand a subject. I think if I can't explain something in a very simple way, uh, for anyone, regardless of background, to understand it, then I probably don't really understand the subject that well myself. And this experience has shaped the way, no joke, of how I approach making YouTube videos today. Like, if I can't take a complex topic, regardless of what it is, and distill it and break it down into its simplest components so that anyone can understand, then I have not done my job. And it was this experience, as well as other teaching experiences, that really influenced me to develop this mindset that I want to explain things well and very clearly. And one thing that I've learned is that explaining things clearly, communicating effectively, this isn't something that you just turn on in the moment. This is something that is a lifestyle. But another really important aspect of this experience was this other person that I met. He became friends with another tutor and he tutored physics. And for privacy reasons, I won't say his name. I mean, I honestly don't think he cares, but for sake of privacy, we can call him Harry Potter. So during these teaching sessions, I met Harry Potter. And so in these sessions, we would literally always talk about quantum mechanics. He was a physics tutor and he was really passionate about physics and he was passionate about quantum mechanics. And he's one of the main influences of why I continued to learn more about quantum mechanics after that semester and why I continue to learn more about it today. So this whole quantum mechanics physics learning thing may seem a little bit out of place right now, but as that smart guy said, uh, it will all make sense later when we're connecting back the dots, but looking forward, it didn't make sense at the time. And so in the summer after that semester that I started tutoring organic chemistry and learning about quantum mechanics is when I interned at NASA. And so I made a whole video about my NASA internship. You can watch that video to check out the details. But in this video, I'm gonna talk more about how that experience fits into the context of the overall story of how I started in computational chemistry. And so essentially in my NASA internship, I learned about all of these computational methods and algorithms in the context of aeronautical problems. And the discussions on the theoretical underpinnings of these algorithms that I had with aerospace scientists throughout my internship 
have shaped the way I now perceive and approach problems today. The problems that I learned and witnessed during my NASA internship are actually completely unrelated to the problems that I see or work with today. But those methods are transferable, or in other words, they can be translated to solve any problem that you want, whether it be chemistry, or it be some burning plane in the sky that's about to crash, or rover in space. For example, in one of the algorithms that I learned, you need to find a way to represent your system before feeding it into your algorithm. In other words, it needs to become machine legible. So if you have some rover in space, you can represent that rover by a matrix of ones and zeros. And the one means that there is a relationship between certain parts in your rover, and zero means that there isn't any relationship between those two parts. The same goes for machine learning and chemistry, right? In order to feed your molecules into whatever machine learning algorithm you have, you need to find a way to represent your molecules. And there's many different ways of doing this. But to draw an analogy to the matrix of ones and zeros that I referred to of the rover, you can think of a molecule as a graph. A molecule can also have a matrix of ones and zeros that represents the different atoms and the bondings between the atoms. And then you could also have a distance matrix. And so this was the mentality that I started to develop throughout my internship. Because like I mentioned earlier, I was teaching a lot of organic chemistry in the semester prior to the internship. And then when I got to the internship, I started to learn about these really cool technologies and computational methods and algorithms. I started to think, how can I apply these methods to solve problems within chemistry? And so I remember like three plus years ago now, I sat down at a Pete's Coffee on Castro Street. I started researching machine learning for chemistry. And I started reading all about chemical graph theory. It's just so funny because at the time, long time ago, I didn't even know what a smile string was. And what's pretty hilarious is that I remember printing out a bunch of machine learning for chemistry papers and all these papers about message passing neural networks for molecular prediction. And I would print out all of these papers and I would read them. And back then I understood it, but I didn't truly understand what was going on. You know, those papers are very relevant. And I reread them a few days ago and like yesterday. And it's just crazy to compare the different levels of understanding that I had X amount of years ago versus today. And so my philosophy is, if you look back at the previous version of who you once was and you laugh, then that's a good thing because that's a sign that you've grown. Essentially at the end of my internship, I knew that I was interested in organic chemistry and also that I was fascinated by all these computational methods that I witnessed throughout my internship. And I wanted, but I just didn't know how to bridge those two domains together. But just you wait, that is all about to change. <laughs> so after my internship, I returned to the fall semester of my junior year. And during that time, I took two pivotal classes. The first class was upper division quantum mechanics and the second was organic chemistry within drug delivery. And so if you recall to the previous part of this video when I talked about uh, meeting my physics tutor friend who really inspired me to learn more about quantum mechanics, that is now relevant here because after all of those conversations that I had with him about quantum mechanics, uh, they really inspired me to take the upper division quantum mechanics class that semester. But after taking this class, I learned that I think anyone who has the chance should take a class in quantum mechanics because I feel like I really didn't understand linear algebra until I saw it in the context of quantum mechanics. I remember going into the final like, okay, when in doubt, when in doubt, just take the Fourier transform. Just take the 48 transform and you'll probably get closer to the answer. <laughs> they ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because- they So in the spring semester, that's when things started to change because I took this game-changing class called Machine Learning and Optimization for Chemical Problems or essentially machine learning for chemistry. And it was taught by Professor Teresa Head Gordon. I actually thoroughly enjoyed this class. So this class was influential to me for a few reasons. I got to witness and learn about the reciprocal relationship between computation and science. Computational methods are largely inspired by science. And in turn, computing can be used to solve questions in science such as molecular property prediction, reaction modeling, as we've seen from the late alpha fold to also protein folding. The machine learning neural networks are largely inspired by the biological circuits and neurons of the brain. Genetic algorithms are based on the principles of natural selection. Simulated annealing is another method that's based on metallurgy. But I think the strongest part of this class was active learning in the form of projects, 
and coding assignments. So for example, in our homework assignments, we would program steep assist set, golden section from scratch. As someone who was very good in programming once told me, you don't truly understand something until you can code it from scratch. Here, here. <laughs> For example, backpropagation. We're so spoiled from all these machine learning packages, but do we truly know what backpropagation is? Can we see the chain rule? Can we see the chain rule? Okay, I've literally been talking for so long that it's dark outside. But alas, we must continue on with our story. One night I was leaving main stacks after a long, long day of studying and grinding for my upcoming midterm. I was walking home and then all of a sudden, I run into my organic chemistry teaching assistant on the street. For privacy purposes, we can call him Draco Malfoy. And I was just like, hey, Draco Malfoy, what are you up to? And he's like, oh, hey, I'm catching an Uber to ride home. And what is the point of the story again? Oh yeah, so I knew that Draco Malfoy was a grad student in Professor Martin Hay Gordon's lab. And I was really curious about what he did in the lab, like what kind of research that he does. And so he's like, hey, why don't you stop by uh, my office hours? I can tell you all about it. So the following day, I show up to his office hours in the dungeons of Latimer. And so I go down there and I start talking to Draco Malfoy about his research. And so Draco Malfoy tells me, well, I think you would be really interested in the research of Professor Hauk over at UCLA. And what's crazy enough is that following week on a Tuesday, Professor Hauk was giving a talk at UC Berkeley. And so I went to that talk and I was like, oh wow, this is really cool and I want to learn more about it. Lo and behold, the following summer, he welcomed me into his lab for a summer of computational organic chemistry research. And so this experience has also been super pivotal for me as well. In this lab, I had a mentor, for privacy reasons, you can call him Dumbledore. Dumbledore. <laughs> so Dumbledore really taught me a lot. Like I owe so much to Dumbledore about all the things that he taught me throughout the summer. I will forever be grateful for the times when he taught me how to use Gaussian from when I knew nothing about what a quantum mechanical calculation even was, when I didn't even know what a basis set was or a level of theory. I would not have the knowledge that I have today without him. This is when the dots really start to connect because if you remember, I told you a, a while back that I was inspired to take quantum mechanics because of my physics tutor friend. Fast forward to this summer, right? When I was learning how to perform quantum mechanical calculations, I started to think about all of the quantum mechanical knowledge that I had gained in that class. I remember that summer when I was searching for a transition state of a molecule and looking at the vibrational frequencies when I thought back to the prior semester semester in Teresa Head Gordon's class when I was learning about the role of the Hessian within computational chemistry and how the eigenvalues correspond to whether or not a molecule is at a transition state, that things started to really click. I started to draw this connection between my past and present experiences and classes. you haven't fallen asleep by now but ultimately all of these experiences have culminated to the work that I do today which is machine learning for chemistry and it's something that I want to continue doing in the future and I strongly believe that data-driven methods to solve problems within not only chemistry but also science is the future. But if you're still here I think the takeaway of this video is that everyone starts from somewhere and to not be afraid to chase after whatever you're interested in and to stay driven to pursue whatever that may be. The differences between those who sit on the sidelines and watch the game versus those who are actually in the game playing is confidence and drive. <laughs>